it order. would be devastating. Senator Green, um, I will allow Senator give Senators a moment, um, showing courtesy to colleagues, to take their seats before we go to first question. I'm just seeing if we have anyone coming online for a moment before I and allow senators to take their seat. Ah. Senator Ciccone. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. In July, the Prime Minister, Mr Morrison, said that the sudden withdrawal of aged care workers during a COVID-19 outbreak couldn't be anticipated or foreshadowed. Why did the Morrison government fail to implement the aged care workforce strategy promised by former Minister Fifield six years ago? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator Ciccone, for his question from um, Victoria online. Uh, Mr President, the, the government is actually in the process of implementing the workforce strategy that was uh, uh, developed uh, by the work of Professor Pelez. And, uh, in, in, in May last year, uh, Mr. President, uh, we uh, funded and established, or industry funded and uh, established, the Workforce Industry Council. That is industry led, which is quite appropriate, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, we continue to implement other reforms out of the work of uh, the Pelez report. Uh, that includes uh, the, the research institution that uh, Professor Pelez uh, recommended. Uh, the Workforce Industry Council appointed their first CEO in June this year. So, Mr. President, we continue to uh, apply the work of that was recommended by Professor Pelez, and, and I've had a number of conversations with him recently about that process and how we, uh, and in fact how we might, um, how we might speed up the process because that's a concern that both he and I share, Mr. President. Uh, and so we can, we continue to not only consult and work with the sector with respect to the implementation of the Pelez report, but I continue to consult with, Prof with Professor Pelez. Uh, he put considerable work into that report, uh, and uh, we have had discussions only in recent times with respect to the process that we that we may be able to speed up the work that was recommended by him. Uh, given that uh, industry, Mr. President, uh, quite rightly leads the Workforce Industry Council as they are the employers and trainers of their workforce, uh, but there is some work that we I think we can do together to increase the pace Order, of that work. Senator Colbeck. Order. I'm going to ask senators to remain silent because it can be occasionally difficult to hear people remotely. Senator Ciccone, a supplementary question. In 2018, the chair of the Aged Care Workforce Strategy Task Force, Professor Pelez, said about the government's handling of aged care, and I quote, they have known about these issues. There's plenty of reports that they have told them, but they have ducked it. The government has made no progress. They've sat on the report. Why has and has this government, the Morrison government, ignored the warnings of its own task force? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr. President, I would not accept the premise of the question. I've clearly exchanged. I've clearly just Order. explained, uh, Mr. President. Order. I've clearly just explained the fact that we haven't ignored the work of Professor P P Pelaire's report. I've explained Order. the fact that we have, uh, following his report. Uh, with, with industry established the Workforce Industry Council that was established by the sector in May last year. They appointed their first CEO in June this year, uh, so, and they continue to build their, their workforce plans. That is their role. Uh, that is their responsibility, and we have funded their work, Mr. President, which is what the report recommended. So, Mr. President, uh, I reject the premise of the question that we have not acted on the report of uh, Professor Pelez. We continue to do that. Order. Senator Ciccone, a final supplementary question. The Aged Care Royal Commission's interim report handed down in October of last year, titled Neglect, revealed significant understaffing across the sector. Brendan from Victoria said his 94-year-old mother, who was removed from a room after testing positive for COVID-19, 
was found not to have had been showered for four days due to staffing shortages. Why did the Morrison government ignore the Royal Commission's warning? Senator Colbeck. Mr President, uh, the Royal Commission in its interim report last year made a number of suggestions to the government, which we immediately took up. Uh, it talked to us about an additional investment Order. into uh, it, it talked to us about an ad additional investment into home care places. It talked to us about getting young people out of residential aged care. It talked to us about uh, a range of things that we have acted on and we acted on immediately, Mr. President. Mr. President, during the circumstance, and I, I'm not sure which facility Senator Chacon is talking about. Uh, there were some circumstances which the government has said uh, we wished hadn't Order. occurred. We, we have acknowledged that in some circumstances uh, some residents didn't get the care that they received in, in the events that occurred in Victoria, particularly in about four facilities that weren't quite critical at the time. So, Mr. President, uh, we have acknowledged uh, and, and apologised for those circumstances. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Molan. Order. Senator Mullen. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, my question is to the Minister for Defence, uh, Senator Reynolds. Can the Minister outline to the Senate the economic recovery measures announced by Defence today and how they are contributing to the Morrison government's COVID-19 recovery efforts? The Minister for Defence, Senator Reynolds. Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I also thank Senator Mullen, not only for his service but for his continuing support yeah. to our forces. Thank you. Uh, this morning, the Prime Minister and I had the great delight of announcing a $1 billion package to support Australia's economic recovery from COVID-19. This package of 22 discrete projects will support around 4,000 Australian jobs right around our nation, while complementing Defence's 2024 structure plan. Firstly, we are accelerating uh, existing capability projects and programs. This $200 million investment will support 445 Australian jobs. Secondly, we are delivering a national estate works program right across Australia, including in bushfire-affected areas. This $490 million investment will support 2,950 Australian jobs. Thirdly, we are enhancing sustainment for existing capabilities. This $200 million investment will support 440 Australian jobs. Fourthly, we are also boosting funding for defence industry grants and defence innovation hubs to support businesses, particularly small and medium businesses, to strengthen our skilled defence industry workforce. This $110 million investment will support 150 Australian jobs. I am so proud and are pleased to report that Australia's defence industry here in Australia has demonstrated remarkable resilience and versatility during this pandemic. We have worked very hard to keep defence capabilities and our Australian economy moving. I commend the Defence Force and also the Defence Department for so quickly adapting to new business as usual ways during COVID-19. And I'm so proud of the work that we are doing together to ensure the business of defending our nation continues both here and overseas. Senator Mole, a supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the minister outline the support provided to local businesses as part of these measures, including the capital region and surrounding areas? Senator Reynolds. Hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President. And again, I thank Senator Molan for his question. Uh, today, the Prime Minister and I made the announcement at Datapod, a Canberra-based company Order. that's been selected to deliver additional deployable data centres to support defence operations. Datapod is a 100 per cent Australian-owned and operated company. This decision will provide job security for Datapod's highly skilled workforce and over 80 manufacturing subcontractors. Datapod is a great Australian success story. It has adapted its business from mining now to defence and to other industries both here and overseas. Datapod is providing opportunities for some of our most talented young STEM students and postgraduate workers who I had the great pleasure of meeting here today. We will also deliver infrastructure and capability projects, Senator Molan, 
through you, President, uh, right across Australia, including in Jarvis Bay, Eden, Rafwagga, and also oh, at Kapuka. Order, Senator Reynolds. Fantastic. Senator Molan, a final supplementary question. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Can the, can the minister advise, please, how these measures are supporting the income of ADF reservists during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Reynolds. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President and Senator Molan. Can I just say again, I am incredibly proud of our reserve forces who have made such an important contribution to our nation's defence. They have served with great honour both on operations overseas and increasingly now on domestic support operations, such as Operation Bushfire Assist and now Operation COVID-19 Assist. Over 3,500 ADF members are supporting all states and territories, and that includes 800 of our Defence Force Reserves. To support these Defence Force Reserves, who are now doing it tough during COVID-19, we're increasing the annual reserve days to, by 210,000 this financial year alone, and we are providing support to recruit an additional 500 Defence Reserves. The Morrison government is backing ADF reserves who have lost their primary form of civilian income. And today's measures will ensure we are best placed Order. to meet Senator the high-risk weather time season. Senator Reynolds, the answer has expired. Senator Carr. Oh, thank you, Mr President. My question without notice is to Minister for Aged Care and Seniors Australian, Senator Colbert. The Morrison government was warned of the risks to the aged care workforce in the event of a COVID-19 outbreak, yet within three days of the first COVID-19 case being detected at the Dorothy Henderson Lodge on the 3rd of March, all permanent carers were forced into isolation. Why did the Morrison government ignore this warning? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Order. Mr President, I reject the premise of the question from Senator Carr. Mr, Mr. Mr. President, uh, in, in fact, uh, we, we acted very, very quickly to ensure that there was capacity to provide surge workforce to the aged care sector in Australia, Mr. President. And in fact, I think the announcement of our funding was on about the 11th of March, which was only a few days after the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak started. So we acted very, very quickly uh, and put over $100 million on the table to support the aged care sector with surge, surge workforce. So, Mr. President, I reject completely the assertion of the question from uh, Senator Carr, because uh, w we acted extremely quickly to ensure that there was capacity available, uh, and we have continued to build and grow that capacity as the scale of the outbreak has continued, particularly in Victoria, Mr. President. So, all through this process, we started engaging with the aged care sector back in January. We talked to them about their re re responsibilities with respect to having an infection control plan. We talked to them about uh, the COVID-19 uh, virus uh, during February. Mr President, we continue to work with this sector and have been there uh, consistently with them all through this pandemic, providing them resources, ensuring they had information, providing advice from the AHPPC, Order. acting on the advice of the AHPPC Mr. President, in, in our response to the pandemic and ensuring that they had information resources available to them to be able to meet the requirements of an infection if in fact it occurred within their facility mr president and it is worth noting that we as we said yesterday 97 percent of facilities in this country haven't had an outbreak uh, which i think is uh, an incredibly good statistic for this country senator carr a supplementary thank question. you mr president within a week of the first covid 19 case being detected at the new march house on the 11th of april 87 per cent of its staff were forced into isolation. Why did the Morrison government also ignore this warning? Senator Colbeck. Well, Mr President, Mr. President uh, not only did we not ignore it, and so I again reject the premise of Senator Carr's question, who just, just completely reject the premise of Senator Carr's question. We continue to build our workforce capacity uh, through uh, the pandemic. We continue to provide additional resources, uh, and we continue to do that, Mr. President. In fact, uh, we, are, we, are, we are working with other sectors to train staff to build on workforce capacity. Uh, one of the reasons that we uh, built the, the, the arrangement with the Victorian government to close 
Uh, elective surgery was to provide additional capacity in the workforce, but also beds within hospitals to relieve the stress on aged care facilities, Mr. President. We, and, and in fact, the hospital agreement, which was part of the national COVID-19 health plan, which predates all of these circumstances, uh, were put in place to ensure that we had the capacity to meet the Order, needs of older Australians. Colbeck. Senator Carr, final supplementary question. Elizabeth from Victoria said hospital doctors found her mother also had a secondary chest infection and a UTI in addition to COVID-19. She had been left in soil nappies for hours on many occasions and for the whole day. How many more of the 1,100 older Australians with COVID-19 in aged care that were dehydrated, soiled and showing signs of neglect as a result of the Morrison Order. government Carr, ignoring these the warnings. Has expired. Senator Colbeck. Mr President, as I have said on a number of occasions, uh, the Prime Minister has said on a number of occasions, in a number of facilities, uh, the circumstances were not as we would have wanted. The, they were not as we would have wanted. And, the, and residents because Order. of the circumstances Order. that occurred did not get the care that we received. We've acknowledged that, Mr President, and we've apologised for Order on my left. But what we have done, Mr President, is we've co continued to build capacity to ensure that the facilities are well staffed, that they are providing the appropriate level of care, uh, and, we have, and, and we will continue to do that, Mr President. Fortunately, what we're seeing now in Victoria is that with the reduction in community transmission, there is also a reduction in the infection rate within aged care facilities, which is relieving pressure. And we are now seeing a reduction in the number of active cases in Victoria, both in staff and aged care residents. Order, Mr. President. So Colbert. there is a direct Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order. Senator Stoker. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is for the Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Can the minister advise the Senate of what the Morrison government is doing to diversify and expand opportunities for Australian exporters and um, Australian businesses during the COVID-19 pandemic? The Minister for Trade, Tourism and Investment, Senator Birmingham. Thanks, Mr. President. I thank Senator Stoker for, uh, for her question and her advocacy for Australian exporters and, uh, and businesses, particularly those from Queensland. Mr. President, without ever compromising on Australia's values or interests, our government works continuously uh, to expand opportunities for our exporters right around our region and the world. Most notably, uh, during the recent parliamentary recess, we welcomed entry into force of the Indonesia Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement on 5 July which will allow over 99 per cent of Australian goods exports to Indonesia by value to enter duty-free or under significantly improved preferential arrangements compared to their counterparts. And Mr President, I am very pleased to advise the Senate that many Australian businesses and exporters are already taking advantage of the opportunities provided by our trade deal with Indonesia. Some 37 semi-trailer loads of duty-free oranges this year have already been shipped to Indonesia. Some 510 tonnes of duty-free lemon and lime exports have already been shipped. Some 963 tonnes of mandarins have already been shipped. Close to 46,000 head of cattle have already been shipped duty-free to Indonesia. We equally see, Mr President, huge opportunities for our grain growers. Ultimately, we will see next year more than 500,000 tonnes of grain able to enter Indonesia duty-free, growing year on year thereafter. Frozen beef and sheep meat tariffs have halved already, uh, and we see duty-free steel making its way to Indonesia as well, close to 5,000 tonnes already by Australian business. This, in addition to the services opportunities created, and to the enhancement of regional opportunities that we will put in place through the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement show just how strongly we are working to help Australian business diversify their Order, trade Senator across Birmingham. our region. Senator Stoker, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister, for explaining those opportunities within our region. Can the Minister also advise the Senate of the measures being implemented to diversify and expand the opportunities for our exporters beyond our region? Senator Birmingham. 
Thanks, Mr. President. Thanks, Senator Stoker. Indeed, beyond our region, our government continues to pursue and negotiate the opportunities for enhanced trade with the European Union and the United Kingdom. And together, there are more than 500 million consumers across those markets, consumers where we see high restrictions, high tariffs and limited and small quotas for many of our particularly agricultural exports. Wine Australia estimates that EU tariffs add up to 25 per cent on the import price of Australian wines into that market. Our beef and sheep meat exporters face small quotas but high tariffs, a significant imposition into those markets. Securing better, fairer access is the goal of our free trade agreements with both the EU and the UK. And I'm pleased to say that we have entered through virtual rounds of negotiations, through the eighth round of negotiations with the EU and two rounds now with the United Kingdom, continuing to make good progress on those and determined to provide further opportunities for Order, our farmers Senator and exporters. Birmingham. Senator Stoker, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Minister, what practical steps are being taken to help Australian exporters take advantage of Australia's free trade agreements and help us grow a COVID-safe economy? Senator Birmingham. Well, Mr President, opening access uh, and reducing barriers through trade agreements is one thing. We then need to provide advice and assistance to Australian businesses to be able to take advantage of those opportunities. And yesterday I was pleased to launch the Indonesia-Australia Business Connect program, a three-month digital program of market webinars led by Austrade uh, to provide business with an Indonesia market entry guide, particularly for our food and beverage exporters. Uh, a program of webinars unpacking market access arrangements, especially for horticulture, meat, livestock and grain producers, online education, training and skills events. And this is uh, sitting alongside a 12-part free digital FTA seminar series that our government is providing. So far, almost 4,000 people have watched these free seminars, but importantly, they are part of the very significant growth in the number of Australian businesses we see exporting. We have managed to see growth of more than 18 per cent of Australian businesses exporting in our term in office, Order, and we Birmingham. want to continue Time to help more businesses to do expired. so. Senator Griff. You, Mr. Uh, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Since 20 March, the federal government has paid an additional $1 billion to the sector to manage the COVID-19 pandemic and continue to provide care for senior Australians in care. What transparency requirements did the government place on the aged care sector to ensure how the additional $1 billion was spent? And is the minister confident that all of the federal funds provided were spent as intended by the Morrison government? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. And uh, the $1 billion that we've made available to the aged care sector to manage the COVID-19 outbreak is not all just paid to the aged care sector. There are a range of programs that provide varying levels of different levels of support under different programs, uh, whether that be to pay for surge workforce, for example, uh, whether that be to support the Victorian Aged Care Response Centre, whether that be to support mental health, uh, or whether that be uh, an uplift to provide capacity for the sector to deal with additional costs that they're facing with COVID-19. Uh, so one measure, in, in fact, in that sense was $205 million, which was a general uplift we provided to the sector, and we will be seeking a reconciliation of that amount. Uh, so, Mr President, uh, we are looking to have a sense of what's occurred with the funding that um, we provide into the sector because we, we think it's appropriate. Uh, the other measures, such as those that support a facility that might have had a COVID outbreak, uh, those funds will be re uh, repatriated to the facilities based on uh, an accounting and paid in arrears. So, Mr. President, there will be a clear uh, understanding of what that funding was used for uh, and, and the capacity for us to reconcile that against the accounts and the expenses that a facility may have occurred in, uh, in managing a particular outbreak. Senator Griff, a supplementary question. With reference, uh, Minister, to the $205 million that you referred to, which was paid on the, or announced on May the 1st, this was given to providers to cover the cost for additional staffing, training, visitations and connections and the provision of PPE during the pandemic. $900 was paid per resident in major metro areas and $1,350 in other areas. Can the minister advise how many additional staff were employed, how many additional training was undertaken and how much additional PPE was purchased per aged care facility? Senator Colbeck. 
Mr. Pre thank you, Mr. President. I thank the Senator for his question. Uh, Mr. President, we, don't, we have not uh, received those reconciliations at this point in time. That money was put out uh, through our uh, usual funding processes to ensure that the facilities had the capacity to meet those costs, uh, Mr. President, and we uh, believe that it was important that we provided that. We understood that the costs were higher in regional Australia than they were in uh, metro areas. That's why we made that important distinction. Uh, but we have not received those reconciliations at this point in time, Mr. President. Uh, uh, so I am not able to give the chamber any advice on that. Senator Griff, final supplementary uh, question. Minister, will you take on notice the uh, request on the previous um, question to actually provide that reconciliation? And do you concede that in order to restore trust with Australians, the government must implement financial transparency rules for the aged care sector to properly account for the billions in federal funds providers receive annually? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and uh, I, I actually agree with the senator that um, financial accountability is a very, very important element of uh, where we go with the aged care sector post the Royal Commission and, and how we respond to the Royal Commission. Uh, in fact, that's one of the conversations that we've been having in our uh, policy development work towards the response to the Royal Commission. I think it's a very important issue. Uh, and transparency and quality indicators as well, which is, I know, something that else that you have uh, an interest in, Mr. President. So, uh, providing some visibility into the quality indicators that uh, uh, apply to the residential aged care sector and the home care sector, I might add, uh, are important. Uh, and we also do have some reporting publicly in respect of home care on the uh, My Aged Care website. So I th my view is that, uh, A, yes, it's important. Order. Senator and Wong on a point of order. Sorry, Senator Colbeck, please resume your seat. Senator Wong on a point of order. Uh, point of order. I, 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 I apologise to Senator Griff for taking a point of order of his question, but the minister was asked to take on notice and come back to the chamber the question he couldn't answer. He hasn't responded to that in this answer as a matter of direct relevance. I'd ask him to do the chamber the courtesy of responding to that request. Senator Cormann on the point of order. <laughs> Minister Colbeck could not have been more directly relevant if he tried. He could order. not have been more directly relevant if he tried. Order on my like, left. You know, it's, and, and, and I think order on my the, left. Senator in terms Wong. of courtesies to the chamber, it would indeed be courteous to Senator Griff if he was uh, allowed to pursue uh, his own questions. Uh, it, it, the minister can respond to an answer any way he sees fit as long as he is directly relevant. Um, I, I believe he was being directly relevant to the answer. Order on my left. Senator Cormann. Interjections are always disorderly. They are. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Wong. Senator Colbeck to continue. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, and I will note that the Royal Commission is looking at those financial disclosure issues, and so we will consider Order. that. Um, and, Mr. I'm President, afraid, I I'm will always, take the, on notice. Time for the answer has concluded. There is therefore no option to have a point of order. Um, but once the answer concludes, uh, that was at one second. Um, once the answer has concluded, there is no point of order on the relevance of the question, unless Senator Griff wanted to ask, ask, uh, raise another point of order. I will then move to Senator Antic. Thank you, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Minister, how is the Morrison government supporting our skill system through the COVID-19 pandemic and putting in place the reforms for a better skill system on the other side? The Minister for Employment, Skills, Small and Family Business, Senator Cash. Well, thank you very much, Mr. President, and I thank Senator Antic for the question. And uh, I will take that interjection from Senator Ayres. Senator Ayres, it is a fact that the federal government does not fund TAFE. Uh, so every time someone on the Labor side opens their mouth and says the federal government has cut TAFE, you are actually wrong. You may want to speak to your own state government because they are responsible. Order but, on Mr. My President, left. this week is actually the tenth National Skills Week. And it is a week in which we celebrate uh, vocational education and training within Australia. And certainly as Australia recovers from the economic effects of COVID-19, a skilled workforce has never been more important. And that is why the Morrison government has made such a large investment in making our school system more responsive to the labour market demands of this country and more attractive to potential students uh, from all walks of life. Mr. President, 
As part of our economic response to COVID-19, uh, we have committed $2.8 billion across 2019, 2020 and 2021 to support small and medium businesses across Australia to retain their apprentices. And that is, of course, through our supporting apprentices and trainees measure. Mr. President, this subsidy will support around 90,000 businesses across Australia, employing around 180,000 apprentices. It will ensure that they are are in, allowed to continue on their jobs despite COVID-19. And in fact, since we launched this subsidy on the 2nd of April, as at the 13th of August, this measure has already supported 87,570 apprentices across 50,260 employers, and it has resulted in $462 million in payments that have been paid out to employers so that they can keep on their apprentices and trainees. Senator Antic, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, Minister, how will the government's job trainer fund support Australians to get skills in the area of demand and drive further reform of Australia's vocational education and training system? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, um, I've referred to the $2.8 billion that the government has committed to support apprentices and trainees uh, as a result of the impact of COVID-19. But we have also now partnered uh, with states and territories around Australia to establish a $1 billion job trainer fund. Mr President, the Commonwealth has committed half a billion dollars uh, towards this fund, and I'm very pleased to say that all states and territories uh, have signed up and have agreed to commit the matched funding. This will now deliver an additional 340,700 places, training places across Australia. Those training places will be free or low cost. Um, they will also be in identified areas of skills needs in individual states and territories. All states and territories have also uh, signed our heads of agreement for skills reform. We are working across Australia with our state and territory uh, counterparts to make positive Order. reform Senator to Cash. the skills Senator agenda. Senator Antic, a final supplementary question. Minister, how will the government's jobmaker plan support labour force recovery and build on the coalition's strong record of economic management and job creation? Senator Cash. Well, Mr President, in terms of the investment in job trainer, in terms of the investment that we've made in ensuring that employers across Australia are able to keep on their apprentices and trainees, this obviously is all part of our broader job maker plan. Mr President, the job maker plan is the Morrison government's plan for economic recovery as a result of COVID-19. And of course, at the heart of this plan is job Order creation, on my left. ensuring that Order. employers across Australia are Senator able to Keneally. stay in business, keep their doors Senator open, uh, and to the extent possible, prosper, grow and create more jobs for Australians. And as part of that job maker plan, undertaking skills reform Order is an integral left. part of it. We need to ensure that we have a training system in place that responds to what industry and employers are telling us they need. We need to have a training system that ensures that the people going through it are job ready at the end of it. Order. And that is Senator what we are committed Cash, to. Time for the answer has expired. Order on my left. Order on my left. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you. My question is to Senator Cormann representing the Prime Minister. Senator, do actions speak louder than words? The Minister representing the Prime Minister, Senator Cormann. Yes. <laughs> Senator Hanson Young, a supplementary question. Back, back in June, the Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian. He promised a COVID support package for the arts. Yet nothing has flowed. Order on my right. Nice words, no action. Why? Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. I completely disagree with the premise of the question. Uh, we have provided substantial support to the arts sector, and of course, large parts of the uh, arts sector and the entertainment sector, of course, uh, are receiving substantial support through JobKeeper. Uh, there was also an announcement in relation to a package to uh, help maximise the recovery uh, in what is an important sector in our economy, and of course, that is being implemented as planned. Senator Order. Senator Hanson Young, a final supplementary question. Two weeks ago, the Secretary of the Prime Minister's Department told the Senate Committee that the money promised by the Prime Minister would not flow until restrictions were lifted. No money has been spent. 
Nice words, no action. What are you doing? Senator Cormann. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Uh, President. I again reject the premise of the question, and I refer you to my answer to your first supplementary question. Order. Order. Senator Patrick. Thank you, Mr. President. My question is to the Minister representing the Attorney General and relates to interlocutory matters and matters incidental to the proceedings of the Commonwealth versus Caleri. During the proceedings, Mr. Caleri has subpoenaed documents from the oil and gas producer Woodside. In response, the Attorney General sought first access to Woodside's return uh, to subpoena on the basis their documents could contain matters related to national security. How is it possible that an energy company such as Woodside could be in possession of documents that could contain matters related to national security? Or is this simply the attorney further abusing the NSI Act? The Minister representing the Attorney General, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr. President. I thank Senator Patrick for some advance, uh, advice of his uh, question. Uh, Mr. President, while I obviously cannot and will not disclose national security uh, information. What I can say in response to Senator Patrick's question uh, is that the, uh, the NSI Act provides a framework for how national security information is disclosed and protected in legal proceedings. It seeks to balance the need to protect national security information with the principle of open justice. Uh, importantly, what protections are put in place are ultimately a matter for the court. With respect to the Senator's specific question, I can advise that the Commonwealth made an application to the court seeking early access to any documents produced by Woodside Petroleum in response to the subpoena dated 2 March 2020. The subpoena called for Woodside to produce documents relating to its dealing with the Commonwealth in relation to negotiations between Australia and Timor-Leste in respect of revenue sharing arrangements under the CMATS Treaty. Given the nature of the information sought by the subpoena, documents produced by Woodside might have included national security information, the definition of which can include international relations, which in turn includes economic relations with foreign governments. It was appropriate for the Attorney General to have an opportunity to consider whether to issue a certificate under the Act or whether any other form or application of application or claim ought to be made in relation to any documents produced by Woodside. Mr President, this was a precautionary approach. It's not uncommon where documents might reveal interaction with the Commonwealth. The application was allowed by the court. Ultimately, Mr. President, I would note to the Chamber and to Senator Patrick that the Commonwealth did not seek any protection orders and the documents were provided to the parties. Senator Patrick, a supplementary question. Thank you for that answer, uh, Minister. Was the Attorney General's interest in the Woodside documents centred on a concern that they would reveal knowledge of a fraud on Timor Leste in relation to the giveaway of Timor's helium uh, assets? To, the, to Woodside and ConocoPhillips. Senator, thank Payne. you, Mr. President. I absolutely don't accept the premise of Senator Patrick's uh, question, and I refer the senator to my first answer. Senator Patrick, a final supplementary question. Th thank you, Mr. President. Is the attorney aware of claims that Timor's helium, a highly valuable commodity, was wrongly characterised as waste in the production-sharing contracts? and therefore lost to Timor-Leste, but a nice profit for Woodside. Is that the dirty secret that is being concealed? Senator Payne. Again, Mr President, I absolutely do not accept the premise of the question from Senator Patrick, and I refer him to my first answer. Senator O'Neill. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, my question, without notice, is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Victorian Liberal MP Russell Broadbent said the government ignored his pleas about the vulnerability of the aged care sector, describing it as, and I quote, disaster waiting to happen. Why did you ignore Mr Broadbent's warning? The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. Uh, uh, thanks, Senator, for her question. Mr President, uh, uh, Mr Broadbent has a perspective on how he believes the aged care sector should be structured. Uh, and uh, I respect his perspective. He talks about the, the changes that were made in the late 90s 
uh, and the opportunity for different forms of providers to come into the aged care sector. Um, Mr. President, I respect uh, um, Mr. Broadbent's perspective on that, but governments since that period of time, since the late 90s, have continued on a path that we see now where we have a range of provider types. We have government providers as uh, through states. We have uh, providers that are community-based. We have for-profit providers and we have not-for-profit providers. Mr. President, that is the current structure of the aged care sector in this country. I will point out the fact that, Mr. President, that uh, we wanted an in, uh, a forensic inspection of the entire aged care sector, which is why the Prime Minister called a Royal Commission, which is currently underway. We look forward to the recommendations of the Royal Commission with respect to its structure of the sector. Point of order, Senator O'Neill. The question was very specific. It was about Mr Broadbent's claim that it was a disaster waiting to happen. That was a very significant warning. Why did you ignore Mr Broadbent's warning? I, I think, with respect to the minister, he, he doesn't have to address a quotation when there's a question like why at the end of it. I think he has done that and he's continuing to be directly relevant. Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, uh, we acknowledge that there were issues with the, the aged care sector in this country, which is why the Prime Minister called the Royal Commission. And issues such as the structure of the sector uh, will be things that the Royal Commission can report on. Uh, we look forward to that report when it's brought down on the 26th of February next year, Mr. President. And, and I have said, left. Mr. President, and the government has said that we will respond to that report uh, once the commission has uh, completed its work in February next year. We look forward to its report. Senator O'Neill, a supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Mr. Broadbent also said he sounded warnings about the Morrison government's aged care system, but was, and I quote, ignored completely. If a member of the Morrison government's own party was ignored completely, what hope do older Australians who are suffering in the Morrison government's broken aged care system have of being heard by this government? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr President. As I said, I respect the views of my friend and colleague, Mr Broadbent, but given the fact that we have actually called a royal commission to look at the concerns and the issues within the aged care sector, and the opportunity exists for any of Mr Broadbent's concerns to be addressed as a part of that process, which I note have been contributed to by other of my colleagues. Senator Fever Andy Wells has made a submission to the Royal Commission appropriately, uh, Mr President, because she had some concerns that she wanted to raise with the Royal Commission and have them addressed. That opportunity has existed for any Australian to make those sorts of uh, for, make a submission to the Royal Commission. So, Mr. President, uh, I don't concede that the government has ignored or dismissed uh, Mr. Broadbent's concerns, because we are now conducting a Royal Commission to look, ha take a forensic look at the entire aged care sector, provide us with Order. recommendations, so that we can then act to improve the delivery of aged care in this country. Senator O'Neill, a final supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. Broadbent was so disgusted that his warnings about the Morrison government's aged care system continued to be ignored, that he resigned from two parliamentary positions in protest. How many of the 335 older Australians who have died might be alive if the Morrison government had not ignored Mr Broadbent's warnings? Senator Colbeck. Uh, thank you, Mr President. Uh, I think it's really unfortunate that the opposition seeks to make the correlation that it does with respect to the circumstance of COVID-19 uh, and uh, other discussions that are, that are being undertaken. I, reckon it, I, th I think it's very, very unfortunate that they seek to, take, to make those sorts of correlations. Mr President, uh, I take very seriously the, the, the uh, views that uh, Mr Broadbent has made. And I've just, as I've just said in the first two answers to questions from uh, Senator, I, I believe the government is taking those in, things into account by conducting a royal commission, Mr. President. We are conducting a royal commission, Mr. President. Every single one of the deaths that have occurred in this country as a result of, of COVID-19 are an absolute tragedy. But I don't seek to make the correlations that the Labor Party, quite unfortunately, tried to do for political purposes. Order.
Order on my left. Order. Senator Scar. Mr President, my question is to the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Can the minister update the Senate on what steps the government is taking in relation to COVID-19 vaccine access in the Pacific and Southeast Asia? The Minister for Foreign Affairs, Senator Payne. Thank you very much, Mr President, and I thank Senator Car Scar for his uh, question and for his, uh, his interest. Uh, the coalition government is determined to ensure that our closest neighbours have access to safe, effective and affordable COVID-19 vaccines. Uh, today we announced that, the, that Australia will contribute $80 million to the Garvey COVAX facility Advanced Market Commitment, or the AMC. The COVAX facility pulls the purchasing power and risk for participating countries. It's going to help fast-track manufacturing and prepare the largest, most diverse portfolio of potential COVID-19 vaccines under development. Importantly, when vaccines have completed full clinical trials and been assessed as safe and effective by the World Health Organization, they will be made available to eligible countries in our region. And Australia is very proud to work with key partners in support of the AMC's aim of mobilising one billion vaccine doses for developing countries in the acute phase of the pandemic. In making this investment, Australia joins contributors including the United Kingdom, Canada, Italy and Norway. We know that international investment in vaccine manufacturing and procurement is stronger when nations work together. I was very pleased during my recent visit to Washington to discuss Australia's commitment to supporting our region with the Gavi chair, Dr Ngozi Okonjo Iwiala. This investment builds on our efforts to secure safe and effective COVID-19 vaccines for Australians. We know that our own security and prosperity are closely linked to that of our closest neighbours. When it comes to this pandemic, we are and we will continue to stand together. Senator Scar, a supplementary question. Minister, how will support for COVID-19 vaccine access in the Pacific and Southeast Asia support recovery in our region? Senator Payne. Uh, Mr President, uh, we know that early access to vaccines will play a critical role in the economic recovery of our Pacific family and regional partners. The AMC itself will initially address, as I said, the acute phase of the pandemic, providing doses for up to 20 per cent of countries' populations, and that includes healthcare professionals, vulnerable groups, including, of course, the elderly. The Pacific countries that are eligible support through COVAX AMC include Papua New Guinea, Solomon Islands, Vanuatu, Fiji, Samoa, Tonga, Tuvalu and Kiribati. Eligible countries from Southeast Asia uh, are Indonesia, Timor-Leste, Cambodia, Laos, Myanmar, the Philippines and Vietnam. As we committed to when we announced our partnerships for recovery to respond to COVID-19, Australia's development assistance is focused on responding to our region's most pressing needs in the recovery from the pandemic. Senator Scar, a final supplementary question. Can the minister advise the Senate on the government's focus on regional health security? Senator Payne. Mr President, Australia's investment in the COVAX AMC builds on our work with neighbours on health security in the Indo-Pacific. And our Indo-Pacific Centre for Health Security delivers our health response in the region, particularly relating to the COVID-19 pandemic. Our contribution to the WHO's Pacific Coronavirus Response Plan is helping Pacific countries to access medical supplies, to receive technical advice in areas such as inf infection prevention and control, uh, and in clinical management. We, of course, know that immunisation saves lives which is why we were also pleased to announce our $300 million contribution to Garvey's broader vaccine initiatives in June. Through all of Australia's international engagements, from the World Health Assembly to Osmin, working across government, we are, de we are work delivering on our commitment to improving health security in our region. Senator Chisholm. Thanks, Mr President. My question is to the Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australian, Senator Colbeck. Senator Fiorenti Wells says, and I quote, the failure of the Abbott government and those advising it exacerbated the already deteriorating situation which has now resulted in the failures in the aged care sector of today. Why was the former Shadow Minister for Ageing and a senior New South Wales Liberal, Senator Fiorenti Wells, ignored by the Morrison government? 
The Minister for Aged Care and Senior Australians, Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I don't believe that uh, Senator Fiorandi Wells has been ignored by the Morrison government. Uh, in, just in the same way that uh, uh, I don't agree with uh, the assertion with respect to Mr. Broadbent, uh, Senator Fiorandi Wells, as I said in answer to a question earlier, has has had the opportunity, by virtue of the fact that. Uh, Prime Minister Morrison called a royal commission into the aged care sector to make a significant contribution to that royal commission. Uh, and, and, Mr. President, I welcome that. I welcome that. Senator Fia Varandi Wells, I, I know because I interacted with her on a number of occasions when she was the shadow minister. In fact, she did some work with me in aged care facilities in the northwest of Tasmania. Uh, put significant amount of effort into the policy work uh, that she did, Mr. President. So, not only do I respect the work that she's done and respect the, the opinion that she has. Uh, Mr. Mr President, Senator Fiorandi Wells has had the opportunity through the fact that Prime Minister Morrison called a Royal Commission to make a contribution to that process uh, and to the determination of this government under Prime Minister Morrison to improve the residential aged care sector in this country. Mr. President. So I, I don't accept the assertion of the question uh, from the minister. Uh, and, and I look forward to the report of the Royal Commission, which is due on the 26th of February this year. Uh, and, and I look forward to then implementing uh, measures off the back of the Royal Commission report to improve the delivery of aged care in this country. Senator Chisholm, a supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Senator Fiorventi Wells also said, and I quote, the coalition failed in their promise to reform aged care and simply opted for a shift that had no demonstrable positive outcome for the well-being of our older Australians. Why was the former Shadow Minister for Ageing and a senior New South Wales Liberal, Senator Fiorventi Wells, ignored by the Morrison government? Senator Colbeck. Uh, Mr. Mr President, I would refer you to uh, the, the, good, the good senator to the answer to my first question. But, uh, can I say my view, and based on my conversations with the Prime Minister about what we will be doing uh, after the Royal Commission makes its final report in, on the 26th of February next year, is that the aged care sector will look very different after we uh, implement our, recommend, uh, our reforms off the back of the Royal Commission. Uh, there is a, a sincere determination to ensure that the sector uh, provides a higher quality of care, Mr. President. So, Mr. President, uh, order. Th the fact that Prime Minister Morrison, very, very early in his prime, minister prime ministership, called a royal left. commission order. into aged care is a Senators, clear demonstration of the determination of this government to improve the delivery of aged care in Australia. Senator Chisholm, a final supplementary question. Yes, Mr. President. Given that even warnings from within the government were ignored, isn't it clear the Morrison government was already failing and neglecting older Australians in residential aged care even before COVID-19 reached our shores? Senator Colbeck. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, we've acknowledged that there are issues in aged care, and if we didn't acknowledge that there were issues in aged care, we would not have called the Royal Commission. As I said, one of the very first, one of the very first. Uh, actions of Prime Minister Morrison was to call the Royal Commission. And of course, Mr. President, even though we have called the Royal Commission, we've continued to implement reforms to the aged care sector while the Royal Commission has continued. We have created the new Aged Care Quality and Safety Commission, which didn't exist until the beginning of last year. We've put in place new aged care quality standards, which started on the 1st of July in 2019. We've commenced the uh, process of, a, of aged care quality indicators and their public reporting. So we have continued to improve the aged care sector. We will continue to do that, particularly off the back of the Royal Commission when it reports on the 26th of February next year. Senator Davey. Thank you. My question is to the minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. How are Enhancements to Services Australia's digital services assisting Australians through the current pandemic and supporting a COVID safe economy. The Minister representing the Minister for Government Services, Senator Rustin. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President, and thank you very much to Senator Davey for her question. 
quite clearly the economic fallout from the coronavirus pandemic has led to an unprecedented demand for access to government services and particularly for Order. Australians who are required to uh, register for income support payments. Um, the government has responded very quickly and we have surged thousands of extra staff into Services Australia to make sure that they are able to handle the increased demand um, to assist people who find themselves in extremely changed circumstances. I'm pleased to advise the Chamber that since the 24th of August— Order. Senator Cormann on a point of order. Point of order. Interjections are always disorderly. Sorry, I, um, well, I, I, I would describe that more as cross-chamber chatter, but that is also disorderly to the extent that ministers can't hear. Senator Wong— I was, Senator, S -S Senator or, Wong is literally uh, interjecting during your uh, ruling. One, order. Order. Senator Wong on the point uh, of order. Uh, Mr President, I'm sorry. I was responding to Senator McKenzie. I, so, I did you know, not hear. A, a, who was responding no. to me? Order. Uh, who was responding to me? And I was asking, why is this bloke a protected species when she had Order. to resign? Order, Senator Wong. Senator Wong. Senator Wong. That was inappropriate. I grant leaders some latitude. Um, I did not see Senator McKenzie. If that is the case, I may have my, my I may have had my eyesight blocked. Cross chatter, cham cross chamber chatter is also disorderly, to the extent that it can be heard by other senators. And there are other places in this building to do that, well spaced, of course. Um, I call, uh, I call um, Senator Rustin to continue. <laughs> okay. Um, thank you very much, Mr. President. Um, uh, but I would like to uh, reiterate Order. what Senator I. Senator Watt, count to ten. <laughs> Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr. President. And it's important that uh, the chamber hears that um, on the 24th of August, the government had paid out $8.8 billion in two $750 uh, payments to eligible Australians as part of their economic uh, support payments. In addition to that, an additional $10.5 billion has been paid as part of the coronavirus supplement to Australians Order. who find themselves unemployed. So um, it's really important uh, that we are able to put in place um, assistance to people so that they are able to easily access the financial support that they need. Services Australia has made sure that we also are working in a COVID-safe environment. We've upgraded our, the capacity at MyGov. Uh, previously, 90,000 people could be on the system concurrently. Since our upgrade, 300,000 Australians are able to use it at any one time. We're making sure that claim forms are much simpler so that people are able to get access really quickly. And we've also made it available so that people can, can obtain a customer reference number and identify themselves online to save them having to attend a Services Australia um, physical site. At the height of the pandemic, we also put in an attempt to claim Senator to assist. Order, Senator Rustin. Time for the answers expired. Senator Davey, a supplementary question. Thank you, Minister. Through you, Chair. Uh, what steps has the Liberal and Nationals in government taken to ensure access to government services for all Australians? Senator Rustin. Thank you very much, Mr President. Well, it's absolutely important that anybody who is in a situation where they're required to self-isolate or quarantine uh, are assisted to be able to stay at home to stop the spread of COVID. Um, eligibility for the job seeker payment has been extended uh, and broadened to include access to people who find themselves sick. Uh, possibly with uh, the COVID-19 uh, uh, virus, who have to self-isolate or quarantine, or who may be caring for somebody who is in those circumstances. And we've also required that they do not have to provide a medical certificate for that period of time as well. Um, we announced uh, last uh, a couple of weeks ago that a pandemic leave disaster payment would be made available to Victorians. And this morning, the Prime Minister has also announced that that is now extended to Tasmanians um, at their request, so that people who are required to isolate or self-quarantine will be able to get access to that two-week temporary payment. More than $9 million has been paid out in Victoria to people, uh, and we're also pleased to announce that people calling Order, up for the Senator first Rustin, time— Order, Senator Rustin. Time for the answer has expired. Senator Davey, a final supplementary question? Yes, thank you. How is the government supporting in particular the residents of our rural and regional border communities to access the services they need during the COVID-19 pandemic? Senator Rustin. 
Um, thank, you, thank you very much, uh, Mr President, and thank you very much, Senator Davey. Well, Services Australia have focused um, also in boosting services in rural and regional Australia. And in fact, today I can announce that there is now a mobile service unit that is uh, providing assistance on the ground in Wodonga, on the other side of the river from Albury, um, for people in that area who may require face-to-face -face services. And can I acknowledge the uh, very strong advocacy of Senator McKenzie on behalf of her own community um, that has uh, allowed us to have the information to understand that the demand exists within that community for this mobile service centre. So we are now able to provide face-to-face -face services for people in that community, uh, and people can uh, start attending the service centre as of 8.30 this morning to 4.30 this afternoon uh, and ongoing at the Junction Square in Wodonga. Um, this will ensure that Victorian communities have access in their own location, but this is in addition, in addition to telephone and internet services Order. that are Senator also Ruskin, available. Senator time for the answer has expired. Senator Cormann. Uh, thank you, Mr President. I ask that further questions be placed on the notice paper. We, we were... Now, can I briefly make a couple of statements, Senators? Firstly, I inform the Senate that I have received a letter from Senator Di Natale resigning his place as a Senator of the State of Victoria, pursuant to the provisions of Section 1 of the Constitution, I have notified the Governor of Victoria of the vacancy in the represent representation of that state caused by the resignation. I tabled the letter and a copy of my letter to the Governor of Victoria. Senators, on another matter, um, I, bring it, I wanted to bring to your attention the Speaker's making a statement in the House about this. I normally don't replicate everything done in the other place, but on this occasion I thought I should. Um, I wanted to make a statement with respect to the medical advice that I and the Speaker have received about the wearing of masks. In doing so, I wish to correct the record with respect to a claim in The Australian today. The Speaker and I have advised that all of our decisions regarding the operations and restrictions in Parliament House since the beginning of the pandemic have been based on advice received from the Office of the Chief Medical Officer. Last Friday, the advice we received regarding the wearing of masks was communicated to all building occupants and the media. We said in the statement, while recognising that the wearing of masks is not mandatory in the ACT, at the specific request of the Acting Chief Medical Officer and out of an abundance of caution in the public common areas of Australian Parliament House, everyone is recommended to wear a mask at all times. As an additional precaution, the wearing of masks is encouraged in the presence of others, especially where physical distancing is not possible and by those at increased risk of COVID-19. The article today claims, according to a source, the CMO wanted a mandatory memorandum for the sitting fortnight but was overruled by the presiding officers. This is incorrect. To allow this to go uncorrected would be to suggest that the Speaker and I had not followed medical advice. Further, it would suggest our statement to all of you that we have always acted on medical advice was not accurate. To make it clear, we have always followed the advice from the Chief Medical Officer or his office when it comes to measures being adopted in Parliament House. Finally, if advice was received that recommended mandating masks here in Parliament House without that requirement being present in the rest of the ACT, the Speaker and I would present that advice to both chambers. I thank Senators. Are there any motions to take note of answers? Senator Watt. Thank you, Madam Deputy President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Colbeck to the questions asked by Labor senators. Well, here we go again. Another woeful performance from the utterly out of his depth, incompetent Minister for Aged Care, Senator Colbeck. This week has truly been a sad series of days here in the Senate watching Senator Colbeck flail around and demonstrate day after day why older Australians and their loved ones can have no confidence whatsoever in the man who is overseeing and running our aged care system in this country. Let's be really, really clear. It is the Australian government, the federal government, that is responsible for keeping older Australians safe in aged care. It's not the state governments, it's not the territory governments, it's not local governments, it's the federal government. It's the federal government that regulates aged care. It's the federal government that funds aged care. It's the federal government whose job it is to keep aged care residents safe. And they have grossly failed in that responsibility. The Prime Minister and the series of aged care ministers we have seen in this government have failed to plan for this aged care crisis, 
They have failed to act when the crisis hit, and they have completely failed to take responsibility for the problems that are of their own making. Now, the Prime Minister, as he is wont to do, says that it's not his fault, it's not responsibility, no responsibility here, and that none of these problems could have been anticipated. The only way you could not anticipate what we have seen play out in aged care homes across Victoria is if you had kept your eyes shut, closed your ears and closed your mouth and ignored the warning after warning after warning we have seen in the seven years this government has been in power about the state of the aged care system and the risk that it posed to residents. Now, today in question time, we have only gone to a small number of the warnings that this government have received. We would need weeks and weeks of question times to point out every warning that this government has received. But let's be generous to the government and just focus on a small number of them. Six years ago, this government was handed an aged care workforce strategy by a committee chaired by an expert, Professor Pelez, and that illustrated what needed to be done to make sure that the aged care sector in Australia had the workforce that it needed. But as we went on to see, with every other warning, that strategy was ignored. It was not implemented. And in fact, just recently, Professor Pelez, who conducted that uh, report, says that there has been no progress by this government in implementing it, and in fact that they have just sat on his report. Well, this government sitting on that report has put the lives of older Australians at risk. They had the opportunity to get the workforce in place. They had a report which told them what to do, and they couldn't get around to doing it over the next six years. And we are now seeing the result of that. Last year, we saw the Royal Commission interim report handed down, titled Neglect. It doesn't get more obvious than that. I mean, what, what, what exactly did the government need from its Royal Commission to realise how serious the problems in the aged care system were? And again, they failed to act. Then we get to this year, once we see COVID hit, we see all around the world the problems that are happening in the aged care system, but nothing is done here to prepare. In March, it starts impacting on Australian aged care centres, the Dorothy Henderson Lodge. Tragically, lives were lost. All the permanent carers were forced into isolation because COVID got into the aged care home. But still nothing was done. So a month later, in April, we see it again, New March House. 87 per cent of staff go into isolation. Again, older Australians' lives are lost because of the failures to take the precautionary measures needed. And of course, then we get to Victoria, where it's run like wildfire through Victorian aged care homes, and we are now seeing hundreds of older Australians die and over a thousand aged care workers contract COVID themselves. This government has known what needed to be done. It has had warnings repeatedly. It has failed to plan. It has failed you, to Senator, act, and it fails to take responsibility. Thank you, Deputy President. And um, the coalition government, uh, and from the Prime Minister, uh, the Minister responsible, Minister Colbeck, uh, and the entire government, uh, has from day one taken uh, issues around aged care, uh, issues around protection uh, of the community in aged care homes and in other settings. Uh, and treated that with the utmost of seriousness, and that is backed by our record, uh, by the amount of investment that we are putting in, by the way that we are responding. Uh, and it would be a lot easier to take seriously uh, the attacks coming from the Labor Party uh, if they didn't resort to the politics of smear uh, against the minister, and if they didn't resort to outright lies. Uh, in order to make their case. Now, uh, the minister, the prime minister, and the government have uh, not only taken this seriously, of course, uh, expressed uh, our sincere condolences to those who have lost loved ones. Uh, but, and we are working to address these issues, and we are continuing to work with other governments. But when we have uh, Senator Watt come in here, 
uh, and engage in the politics of smear, uh, it needs to be seen for what it is. It needs to be seen for what it is. It would be a lot easier to take it seriously if they didn't have to resort to outright lies, as we have seen on a number of occasions, on a number of occasions in this space. If the attack, if the attack was to be taken seriously, if we were to believe that they were actually sincere, well, they wouldn't have to do bald-faced lies in this place and in the other place. We had it in question time again today, where they claim, and they did it in the House uh, today. Senator Selger, uh, please resume your seat. Senator Polly, just bring, Madam Acting Deputy President, just want to bring to your attention the language that the good senator is using is unparliamentary, and I ask him to withdraw it. Uh, Senator Seselja, whilst you haven't named senators directly, it is, it's close to the wind, so I'd ask you to refrain, if you wouldn't mind. Please continue. Thank you, and I thank you for your guidance. And, and so there have been. The Labor Party has been going in there into the House of Representatives and the Senate and outright lying when it comes to aged care. And, and we can go to the facts, because, because Mr Albanese— uh, Senator Seselja, please resume your seat. Senator Polly. Yes, I just—Madam uh, Acting Deputy— uh, President, raise with you again the issue mm -hmm. of the assertions of the senator is unacceptable and unparliamentary. I'd ask you to remind him or ask him to withdraw. Thank you, uh, Senator Seselja. You can't actually say people have come into this chamber. So, yes, that's my advice from the clerk. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you. Senator Seselja. Uh, so the Labor Party has been going around the place lying uh, about this issue because. And, and it, it goes to the fact that this is about politics rather than getting to the substance of the issue. The, the substance of the issue is something this government takes uh, seriously and treats with the utmost seriousness. But when you have to come in and claim that we have cut funding, when you have to claim that we have cut funding, when we inherited a spend in aged care of $13 billion, a tick over $13 billion annually from the Labor Party. That has gone up to $22 billion and, in the forward estimates, will go to $25 billion. Wow. So when the Labor Party comes in here and pretends uh, that they are serious about the issue, that they are serious about accountability, well, let's go to the fact that they don't want to actually speak to the facts, that they want to actually make up their own numbers, false numbers, fake numbers. And that's what we've heard from Mr Albanese uh, in the other place, and that's what we've consistently heard from, from senior Labor. Well, we've got the budget papers where it goes, where it goes from $13 billion when we came to government to $22 billion. Uh, we are taking this issue seriously and we'll continue to take this issue seriously. But when, when you see this kind of smear from Senator Watt and when you see this kind of dishonesty from other members of the Labor Party, well, it goes to the other fact. And that is that they are running a protection racket for the Victorian government, for the Victorian Labor government. You know, at no stage in considering the facts of the matter and considering the serious challenges uh, in aged care facilities in Victoria, do they go to the fact that these things are happening in Victoria because of the serious failings of Dan Andrews and the Victorian government uh, in quarantine, in testing and tracing. I mean, this is a government. This is um, a government that wouldn't Senator that had Seselger. the toughest lockdowns. Senator uh, but the biggest Please resume your seat, Senator Polly. So, acting Deputy President, uh, Madam Deputy President, I just draw your attention that we should be using the correct titles. Uh, it is Premier Dan Andrews. Uh, thank you, Senator Polly. Senator Seselja. Thank continue. you, thank you. And, and it is Premier Dan Andrews and his failings that this lot over here want to run a protection racket for. They want to ignore the failures of quarantine. They want to ignore the failures of testing and tracing. I mean, this is a government and Premier Dan Andrews, who, who, who acted like a dictator during this process, where he would be stopping people. He had the toughest lockdowns and the biggest failings. The toughest lockdowns and the biggest failings, and the people of Victoria are suffering the consequences. And those on the other side ignore that. I haven't heard a Victorian senator come in here, a Victorian Labor senator come in here and raise one 
iota of criticism of Dan Andrews and the Victorian Labor government. Why is it happening in Victoria and not in New South Wales? Has New South Wales not faced similar challenges? Of course they have, but they have responded differently. And This goes to the heart of the political attack. They will lie, they will smear and they will continue to run a protection racket for their mate Daniel Andrews in Victoria. Uh, thank you, Senator Seselja. Senator Chisholm. Uh, thanks, Madam uh, Deputy President. Uh, what we saw is a performance there from Senator Sajelja that was completely unbecoming uh, of this chamber. Uh, one of the things that I have really uh, found difficult to deal Order. with over the last couple of months, uh, as I've spoken to some of my Victorian colleagues and heard the first-hand accounts from them of the work that they've been doing dealing with the aged care crisis in Victoria, and they have been uh, traumatised by the work that they have had to do helping out their constituents. Um, in aged care. And some of the stories that we have been highlighting as part of our work here this week have been really important to put a spotlight on the neglect of this government. And what we went through in question time today was not only the neglect that this government have been responsible for this year, but this goes back over many years that this government are responsible for the neglect in aged care. Uh, and we saw through the questions from uh, Senator Watt, from, uh, we're also from Senator Ciccone, Senator O'Neill, Senator Carr and myself, was they were warned by experts, they were warned by their own reports, but they all were all also warned by people on their own team, by uh, Mr Broadbent, by Senator Fairventy wells that numerous times within their own show were they warned about their neglect of aged care. Uh, and what we saw from Senator Ciccone and Senator Carr is they focused on the workforce issues. As Senator Watt mentioned, they had a report on that years ago that they failed to actually take any action on. And Senator O'Neill and myself focused on the warnings from colleagues. But there is a history and a pattern with this issue and this government when it comes to difficult challenges. Uh, and there's a timeline through this that tells the story of the government's neglect of aged care now going back five or six years. Uh, and the timeline actually centres around the now Prime Minister, who was Treasurer at the time. And we know that uh, in December 15 and May 2016, as Treasurer, the now Prime Minister cut $2 billion from the aged care budget. This has real consequences, these decisions. Uh, in June 2018, the government received a report from the Aged Care Workforce Task Force, Strategy Task Force and fails to implement its recommendations. And what's happened after this? Uh, what we know, and the anniversary was recently, and I'm sure Senator Cormann recalls this as well, on the 24th of August, Scott Morrison becomes Prime Minister. And we saw uh, Minister Colbeck re re respond on this one numerous times today. We know that a few weeks later, he calls a royal commission into aged care. And what we know with this Prime Minister, before he makes any decision, it's politics first, it's politics second and it's politics third. So we know in those three weeks after he became Prime Minister, before he called a Royal Commission, he would have been sitting around with his colleagues, right, what do we have to try and neutralise to get through an election campaign? I know, let's have a Royal Commission into aged care. So their motivation wasn't to fix these problems. Uh, their motivation was to get this off the agenda so they don't have to deal with the real challenges of aged care between now and their election. Uh, and that's what their motivation was. Their motivation was always around the politics and not around fixing these challenges. Uh, and we know this because they received the interim report from the, the Royal Commission titled Neglect. Like, what could possibly get you more motivated to take action than receiving a report titled Neglect? And they fail to act on its findings. And then what we've seen this year is the devastation that this government needs to be held accountable for. Uh, we saw aged care homes hit throughout the world, providing a warning shot for Australian government to be ready. Uh, we know in March and April there are outbreaks, outbreaks in New South Wales. And then obviously over the last couple of months we've seen the devastation in Victoria. Uh, there's one figure that Senator Sajolja didn't mention and that's the more than 300 deaths that we've had in Victoria as a result of this, and more than 1,000 people battling the virus at the moment. So Minister Colbeck happens to be the one uh, who is in the job now that is bearing responsibility for these decisions that this government have made over numerous years. And the minister was warned, and this government was warned, of years of neglect, and he's the one there when it has all caught up with him in devastating fashion 
because they have been found wanting in aged care. They've been found wanting in their response to uh, COVID and how they deal with that. And there is no doubt that there is a lack of confidence in this minister um, to deal with this COVID outbreak. But the long-term worry for Australians is he's not going to be capable enough to actually put in the long-term reforms that aged care needs. And this is what the Australians and this is what this government need to be held accountable for. Thank you, Senator Chisholm. Senator Molan. <coughs> Thank you, Deputy President. We have taken responsibility. We have acted. We will continue to act and we will act effectively from day one, based on our record, and our record is known, and we will be accountable. We will not smear and we will not lie. What we've seen the last few days is a game of numbers that is a disgrace to those who have suffered in aged care or anywhere else in COVID-19. Perfection, perfection, Order. Deputy President, perfection might be something which exists in the world opposite. But in the real world in which we live, let's look. Let's look at how we have gone comparatively. Every death in Australia, as we know, due to COVID-19, including deaths of older Australians in residential aid care, of course, it's a tragedy. And I extend my deepest sympathy and condolences to the families and carers of those who have died. I also acknowledge the extraordinary work that's been put in by the workers, the dedicated aged care workforce, who turn up and work and face extraordinarily confronting situations each and every day. But, Deputy President, this is an important point. During the COVID-19 pandemic, no country has been able to avoid outbreaks in residential care, aged care or deaths when there has been widespread community transmission, as we saw in Premier Dan Andrews' Victoria. I reject the assertion totally that Australia has a high death rate in residential aged care by international comparisons. The contrary, in actual fact, is true. Of course that doesn't detract from the tragedy of every death, and I know that the opposition do not like facts, but these are the facts. Australia's overall COVID death rate as a proportion of cases is around 2.1 per cent, compared to 13.1 per cent in the UK and 3.2 per cent in the USA. Our death rate in aged care across Australia as a proportion of total aged care residents is around 0.18 per cent, or 1.2 per cent in 1,000 compared to 5.3 per cent in the UK, where nearly 20,000 deaths have been seen. These are the facts. The opposition has been playing some mathematical game, some fund catch-me-out mathematical game for a week or so. These are the mathematical facts. In the UK, of the 9,081 care homes included in a recent study, 56 reported at least one confirmed case of coronavirus by the staff or residents, compared to the 7.7 per cent in Australian aged care homes—56 per cent in the UK compared to 7.7 per cent in Australian aged care homes. Nationally, there have been 25,503 cases of COVID-19 including 525 deaths. Of those deaths, 342 have been aged care recipients, being residential 335 and home care 7. This represents, Deputy President, a national crude case fatality rate, fatality rate of 2.1 per cent and a per capita death rate of 2 per 100,000 population. Globally, there is a, these are the global figures. Globally, there is a crude case fatality, fatality rate of 3.7%. Whereas Australia's crude case fatality 
is comparatively lower at 2.1 per cent. So 3.7 per cent across the world, 2.1 per cent in Australia. By comparison, the United Kingdom, the United States and Canada's crude case fatality rates are United Kingdom 13.1, United States 3.2, Canada 7.4. Deputy President, we have taken responsibility. We have acted. We will continue to act, and we will act effectively from day one, based on our record. And we will be accountable you, without Mullen. smearing or lying. Expired. Senator Ayres. Madam Acting Deputy President, I'm sure I'm not the only person in the chamber or listening to that last contribution who finds uh, the, the, the direct the, 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 effort, the effort to obscure the government's responsibility with a wall of figures as odious as, odious as we should. The idea, the idea that Senator Molan Senator Ayres, resume your seat. Order. Order. Senator Ayres has the right, Senator Wong, to be heard in peace. Silence. Sorry. <laughs> I'm in silence. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Ayres. I'd settle for a bit of peace at the moment. The, uh, comparing, comparing our performance in Australia, first world developed country, to Florida or the United Kingdom, old Jim's ideological bedfellows, where it's a complete and utter disaster, exactly where, exactly where Prime Minister Morrison would have taken the country if left to his own devices, Order. is absolutely odious. But this is about aged care. Minister Colbeck's performance in this chamber during question time today and yesterday and the day before has been excruciating. It should be a source of shame to him and embarrassment to his colleagues. But the problem is much deeper than Minister Colbeck's embarrassing performance. It's systemic. It's political. It's an abject failure of governance. And it's a symbol of the utter contempt that this government has for its most basic responsibilities, that is to govern in the interests of all Australians in this case, older Australians who deserve our respect, our love and the highest standards of service, not cuts or a system that's all about profiteering and neglect. There were plenty of warnings, and we went through those in some detail in question time today. Forty per cent of US COVID deaths have been in aged care facilities, 80 per cent of Canada's deaths. The outbreaks at New March and Dorothy Henderson Lodge in March. At the height of the New March crisis, 87 per cent of their staff were unable to attend work. No action from the government. Federal advice was to prepare for up to 30 per cent of staff being infected or quarantined. Yet this so-called surge funding, breathlessly announced in another press conference, another announcement, only 50 per cent of it has been spent. A report was handed to the government on April 14 from Professor Gilbert. It's only made sub public when it was submitted to the Royal Commission into Aged Care. It focused on the Dorothy Henderson Lodge outbreak where six people died. The warnings unheeded. It's abundantly clear that Minister Colbeck isn't fit to run Australia's aged care system, uh, which is why, despite having the title of Australia's aged care minister, He's had much of his responsibilities in this pandemic stripped away from him. The safest bet in politics at the moment is that Senator Colbeck's ministry will not survive the next reshuffle. But why was Senator Colbeck ever put in charge of our aged care system? Senator Colbeck has got no experience in the sector, briefly served as Minister for Tourism and International Education, in 2016 was demoted to fifth place on the Liberal Party's Tasmanian Senate ticket and only returned to the parliament because former Senator Parry had to leave. A man who the Tasmanian Liberals didn't even want to put into an electable position on the Tasmanian Senate ticket has been put in charge of a system that provides care for 1.3 million older Australians. Beyond 
supporting the appointment of this prime minister the, uh, of this minister the prime minister is deeply implicated in the aged care crisis as determined as he always is to avoid responsibility aged care is funded and regulated by the federal government it is a core federal responsibility there's no shortage of sympathetic words from the prime minister crocodile tears focus group tested apologies for the residents of Australia's aged care system, but his fake empathy derives from only one thing, and that's fear of exposure of his role, of his role in the running down of Australia's aged care system, in the cuts to funding to Australia's aged care system, and for his role as an utter failure in doing what should have been done all of this year to make sure that we defended Australia's aged care residents against the coronavirus pandemic. The question is the motion moved by Senator Watt be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. The contrary, no. The ayes have it. Senator Hanson Young. Thank you, Mr. President. I rise to take note of the answers given by Senator Cormann to my question today relating to the lack of action this government has taken to support the arts and entertainment industry. I asked the minister whether actions spoke louder than words. His response was yes. But of course, as we go through what the government has actually done in relation to the arts and entertainment sector in the midst of this pandemic, it's quite clear that they speak a lot, but they don't do a lot. There's a lot of promises made and very little delivered. The Prime Minister stood with Guy Sebastian, you know, the Australian Idol superstar, back in June. He promised that finally, after waiting for months, the arts and entertainment industry would receive some funding. Two months later, while arts industries, while workers in the arts, those in, creative, in the creative sector have struggled with very little support, we still see no money flowing. I was puzzled about this, so I asked the head of the Prime Minister's own department a couple of weeks ago in the middle of the, uh, as part of the Senate's COVID committee. Under questioning, the department secretary said, well, no, no, no money is going to flow until after restrictions have lifted. Well, that is simply not good enough. That is not what the Prime Minister had promised. It's not what he told Guy Sebastian he was going to do, and it's certainly not in the spirit of the announcement that he made. Now, why does this matter? It matters because the reason our Australian artists are struggling right now is because of the restrictions themselves. That is why it's the arts and the entertainment industry that have been the amongst the hardest hit. As soon as those restrictions were put in place in March, entire shows, productions, events were shut down overnight. People lost their jobs, they've lost income, they've lost access to insurance, and of course the JobKeeper supplement has not been made accessible to many of these workers or these businesses because of the nature of the gig-to-gig -gig type of environment that they work in. So artists have been left out largely by JobKeeper, and now they are not even getting the money they were promised. So it seems under this government's watch, words are fine, but action is lacking. Under this government, as long as they can get a photo op with a few celebrities, they think they've done their job. They think they've done their job. Well, it is not good enough. Australian artists can see this for what it is. The Australian people can see this for what it is. You know, what's next? The Prime Minister lines up a press conference with Tina Arena. Is that what he's looking for? He wants to stand there with Tina Arena and say, oh, yes, oh, sorry, we did promise the money. We'll try again. We can't trust this government. They just don't care about Australian artists, the music industry, the festival industry, our authors, our First Nations artists. These are all people who are struggling right now. 
A press conference with a few celebrities might look good for the nightly news, but as sure as hell doesn't deliver the support that's needed. This government needs to think very carefully. We are on the brink of losing an entire generation of artists in this country. Six months on and no money has flowed. It is precisely during the restrictions that money is needed. It is to ensure that businesses can stay afloat, that workers can be paid, that artists can keep paying their bills while continuing to create. It is precisely during the restrictions that this support is needed. So I ask the minister again to take on notice and to think very carefully. Is it really the view of this government that no money will flow to Australian artists until restrictions are lifted? Because if that is the case, this whole package is a sham. If that is the case, it is quite true that this government doesn't care about artists, they don't care about the creative industries in this country, and they simply don't get the cultural and artistic value to our society and our broader community. The question is the motion moved by Senator Hanson Young be agreed to. Those of that opinion say aye. Contrary, no. The ayes have it. I shall, uh, are there any notices of